Hello. Good morning, everybody. So a completely different type of hydrogen now. Um, we're going to take hydrogen, push it together, and make fusion power. Um, we've just heard how the fusion economy, uh, the, the hydrogen economy is real and happening now. Well, fusion power is not quite real and not quite happening now. Um, but I do hope that you come away at the end of this talk thinking that it's a lot closer and that real progress is being made. Um, so why fusion to start with? Well, I often say that you could do worse than take policy advice from Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking was asked, what big idea do you want to see humanity implement? This was on the last page of his last ever book. And he said, this is easy. I want to see humanity deliver fusion. And Hawking said that because of the huge potential benefits of fusion. Um, it's inherently low carbon, doesn't produce any carbon, inherently safe. You can't get a chain reaction, a runaway event that you could with conventional nuclear. It would be reliable in that you don't wait for the wind to blow or the sun to shine. It's inherently sustainable. Our fuel is seawater and lithium. We have plenty of both on the scale that we need it. And it is pretty much the most energy dense thing that you can do on the planet. So very low land use for power output. But it's really hard. We know fusion works. It's happening in all of our stars. It's happening in our sun right now. It's the root cause of pretty much all of our energy. But it happens in the sun because of the enormous mass of the sun, forcing the hydrogen fuel close enough to make it fuse. We obviously cannot recreate the mass of the sun here on Earth. So instead, we have to take the fuel to about 10 times hotter than the center of the sun, between 100 and 150 million degrees. Right, so that's a big challenge. Um, we do that in a device called a tokamak. This is the primary way of doing fusion, where we take that fuel to 100, 100 million degrees. Um, and we do that by holding the fuel using very large magnets, pretty much the biggest magnets that you can conceive. Hold the fuel away from the wall, levitate it away from the wall. Obviously, if you let it touch the wall, it would, it would melt. Um, and we know that that works. We've been operating this device. This is a machine called JET. It's the largest fusion facility on the planet today. Um, and just this year, we broke the world record for fusion energy released. In fact, broke that record by about a factor of three. So real progress is being made. Um, there's nothing else on this scale operating today. It's a real industrial scale plant. Um, but it only runs for a few seconds because the magnets are made of copper, um, because the machine was built 35 years ago. And that's obviously not a way to produce consistent power. So imagine this is a little fire, a little fire that doesn't operate for very long. Now we need to make that fire bigger, get a bigger thermal output. Now you can take the very crude approach to that of just build a bigger fire and it will run for longer. And that's what this is. This is a bigger fire. This is a machine called ITER. This is the largest scientific collaboration ever undertaken by humanity. Uh, most of the industrial world involved in this project. It is aiming to show that you get a big net gain. So you put 50 megawatts in to get the fusion happening in the first place, it will produce 500 megawatts of thermal power out. So it shows that fusion can be done on a commercial scale where you're producing 500 megawatts of thermal power. Um, and this machine is now about 80% complete, uh, ready for, for turning on in just a few years' time. So fusion is beginning to get to the point of delivery. We're just going to fly through the inside of the machine here to give you some sense of scale. Uh, I, I often use the analogy of a sports stadium. It's like a sports stadium. It's about 120 meters long, about 80 meters deep, 80 meters across. It's a massive piece of infrastructure. These segments of the vessel that we're flying through here, this is actually where the hydrogen fuel will be contained. The vessel is about 60 meter circumference. They need to be, they're like segments of an orange. They get put together um, with very, very large magnets, sort of sandwiched together and then dropped into the, into the containment vessel. Those 60 meter circumference segments need to be welded to a precision of a few millimeters. This is really, really complicated high precision engineering. And to make it even more complicated, it's an international project where all of the components are being provided in kind. So you've got lots of partners all around the world providing these components, magnets being built in all of the different partners being shipped to the location in France to be assembled and ultimately to be craned into this pit where ITER will begin operation in just a few years' time. A phenomenal piece of engineering. So that's making a bigger fire. But that is very large. 
and will be very expensive. So can we drive down the scale and the cost of delivering fusion? Well, there are two different ways of doing that. If you take your fire and you want it to produce more heat, more thermal output, let's put some insulation around it to start with, turn it into a furnace. So in magnetic fusion, that means more magnetic field. So can we make bigger, better magnets? Well, the, the, con the, um, the conventional wisdom was no, we couldn't do any better than the magnets that ITER was using. These are the largest, most powerful magnets that have ever been built. Until this year, where a company spun out of MIT called Commonwealth Fusion Systems produced a 20 Tesla magnetic field. ITER's 12 and a half Tesla, they produced 20 Tesla on a large bore magnet. This is three meters across, it weighs 10, 10 tons. A really large magnet, um, a new record for magnetic field. And magnetic field is a really good thing for magnetic fusion. So you can get more fusion out. And they are now proceeding with the design of a small machine called Spark, which will test these very high, high, high magnetic fields and show that you can get a fusion gain. So this is really exciting. So that's a better insulation. Put better insulation around your fire. Or maybe you shape your fire in a different way to optimize the, uh, the thermal output. And that's the approach of the so-called spherical tokamak. The conventional fusion is done in a ring donut. We're squeezing that ring donut into a sphere, so it looks like a, an apple with the core removed. Take, the, take the, the core out of an apple. Looks spherical. That uses the magnetic field much, much more efficiently. And the magnets are really what you pay for and the buildings that you put them in. So if you can use your magnets more effectively and put them in a smaller building, you can strip out billions from the cost. And another private company, Tokamak Energy, this year reached a major milestone where they achieved 100 million degrees in this compact design, showing that this really can be produced a very high temperature in a small machine. Now, either of those approaches, either a more insulation around your fire or a better geometry for your fire, mean that you have a big heat exhaust challenge. So one of the biggest problems of fusion is that we actually have too much heat, right? The fuel is 100 million degrees. So how you extract that heat and turn it into electricity or turn it into usable heat is a massive challenge. So actually my organization built this machine, a machine called Mast Upgrade, which is all about testing a very clever exhaust system, an exhaust system on your car, make sure that you can get the heat out without melting the tailpipe. And that's what we're doing here. So is if we can insulate better, we have a hotter fire, how are we going to get the heat out and use it to produce electricity? So this is a little cartoon to run you through what's happening. Um, in the middle, the pink donut there, is the fusion fuels. That's hydrogen fusing together to produce uh, release energy. So you can see the particles are whizzing around inside that 100 million degrees soup, um, producing energy. But some of them will escape. Some of them get out of the confined region and they go down and they hit essentially a sacrificial surface at the bottom. Now in a compact design or with better insulation and more magnetic field, that surface would melt. So you need a solution to this or else you can't, you can't build more compact, cheaper plants. So what we've done is extend the exhaust pipe. Um, it's like wrapping your exhaust pipe up and down your car so that by the time it gets out to the end, it, it, doesn't melt your, your, the, tail, the tail of the car. So we've extended the exhaust pipe using a very clever magnetic geometry, and that allows us to drop the heat, which is incident on the first wall. So these two, these two lines, we, uh, we predicted what was going to happen in this new machine 10 years ago. So conventional design, the way that ITER is built, the way that all fusion power plants have been built to date, compared to this new exhaust pipe system in the blue line, and you see that we drop the heat, which actually gets out to the wall and might, might damage the structure, by at least 10 times. That's what we predicted would happen. As I say, we made this prediction a decade ago. We then took seven years to build this facility. We turned it on this year, and these are our first results. This, this tells me two things. One, that our models work, and two, what we built works, because it does exactly what we predicted it would do. And this means you really can conceive of much more compact fusion plants which make them much cheaper and take less space. So this is a really huge step forward for fusion. And talking about steps, we are now pursuing a device called STEP, which will be a prototype power plant actually produced net electricity, aiming for a much lower capital cost than the alternative approaches to fusion design. Um, the UK government have now invested about $300 million into the concept design phase, and we will be uh, choosing a site for that facility this year. Um, Finally, something completely different. Uh, what I've talked about today is fusion achieved using very large magnets. There is actually another, there are 
alternative ways of producing fusion. This is an approach um, really championed by the Lawrence Livermore Lab in the US, where they take a tiny little pellet of fusion fuel, hydrogen fuel frozen, about the size of a, a coin or your thumbnail, and then um, 190 very high power lasers all impinge on that tiny little capsule at the same time, compress it to very high density, which allows fusion to happen. You can see the fusion yield against time since that machine was built about 10 years ago. It had been, it had been going up and improving every year until this year where it absolutely rocketed. And they get very close to a net gain now where they, they're producing more thermal fusion power out compared to the thermal power that enters the machine. So this is really impressive, um, impressive progress this year and there's more to come. So they can optimize this even further and, and yet improve the fusion performance even further. So enormous progress actually happening today in our field and that is actually being borne out by private investment. We just heard about 240 billion in hydrogen. We're not at that level yet. But there is now about 5 billion invested in fusion startup companies. And most tellingly, much like hydrogen, about half of that has happened in the last nine months. So the market appetite is definitely on a very steep upward trajectory at the moment. More and more fusion companies being born all the time and more and more investment. So the private sector definitely has market for appetite, appetite for investment in this space. So I hope that I've given you the, the impression that major advances are happening in fusion right now. Some world records have happened in the last 12 months, a new world record for magnetic fusion energy produced, a new world record for inertial laser energy produced, a new magnetic field record, a new heat extraction record. So loads and loads of massive things are happening in our community. New companies being born almost every month. Substantial investment, both from the private sector and ambitious, ambitious government policies and a massively increasing industrial participation in delivering this. So of those investors, there are six oil and gas majors now invested in fusion, which tells me that the market is changing and viewing fusion as something which is going to happen. It will be a when, not an if. Okay, thank you very much.